So to start with, I'm going to have both of you actually say and spell your name and um, give us the title that you have here. Whoever wants to go first. I'm Jenny Williams, J-E-N-N-Y, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S, and I am co-owner with my husband of Frog Level Brewing Company. And I'm Celeste Ibanez, C-E-L-E-S-T-E-Y-B-A-N-E-Z, and I am the Chief Operating Officer. All right. And daughter. And daughter. And daughter. <laughs> That's the important As part. As if you couldn't tell, the beauty runs in the family. <laughs> so today is Monday, July 2nd. We're at Frog Level Brewing in Waynesville, North Carolina. Um, this is an interview for the Wellcrafted NC Project. And so to start off, whoever wants to go first, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Are you guys, are y'all from around here? Or how did, how did you get here to Waynesville? Mm-hmm. My husband and I are both originally from Haywood County, um, and then we both grew up, went separate directions, and um, he joined the Marine Corps, I joined the Navy, and after our careers in the military, we came back here and eventually met up, married, and... Raised a beautiful daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was born and raised here, obviously, so... Yeah. Yeah. So... How did you guys first get involved in the beer and brewing industry? I mean, you, you mentioned the military background. Mm-hmm. I guess the first question would be, when did you guys leave the military? But how did, what was the path from military to here? Well, my husband uh, retired from the Marine Corps in 2003 after he went was deployed to Iraq. And uh, I was a Navy nurse. When I finished my original stint on active duty, I just remained in the reserves and then had a civilian career, but stayed in the Navy reserves until I retired from Navy reserves. He had always wanted to homebrew, and so he kept saying, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna make some beer sometime." And so he and his buddies would talk about, "We're gonna brew, we're gonna brew," and they never did. We made a trip to New Mexico and went to a small brewery there in Albuquerque and he said, I'm doing it. So we came home, he bought the stuff to make his first home brew, which was a mess all over our house. And and so he said, I think I want to have a brewery. So I got up one Saturday morning and I printed off all the paperwork and I said, Okay, here's the paperwork. No more excuses. Let's do it. That's how it got started. And what, what year was that? That was... 2010. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, was a, I was still in high school. That's how I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And were there other breweries in this area when you guys opened? We yeah. were the first brewery in Haywood County. Um, the only other brewery in our area was in Silva. Um, other than the Asheville district, which has always been exploding with beer. Um, but Heinzel Munchen was the only brewery at that time in Silva. And then we officially opened in 2011 and were the first brewery here in Haywood County. Mm-hmm. And followed quickly by two others. Fairwater is the tipping point, yeah. yeah. And how about you, Celeste? How did, how did you end up kind of joining into the family business? So, um, like any normal child, I had chores. My tours were just a little bit different. My tours were scrubbing labels off of beer bottles <laughs> so that we could <laughs> bottle beer. <laughs> so that was my contribution um, from, the, from the beginning. And then we did tastings um, up at the Gateway Club for around 10 months, and I was a server there. So I was able to um, contribute by my bubbly personality and my sturdy <laughs> arm <coughs> with a tray. Um, and then once we finally opened this place, I was a bartender and started college. I graduated from Western Carolina in 2014. Um, and this place was a very big contributing factor in my major. So I graduated with a degree in entrepreneurship and innovation management. And I solely contribute that to Clark and Jenny um, and their entrepreneurial path here. So. Here I am. She finished in three years with honors. Highest honors. Oh. (laughs) She's smart. She's got to get a little humble brag. Well, you know. (laughs) Get my smarts from my mom. Brainiac. (laughs) So, um, 
it was, it's only recently, though, that you've taken over kind of as the... Correct, yeah. So I moved to um, Savannah, Georgia, and sort of lived the corporate America life for a little bit. I was in um, the training program for Enterprise Holdings and accelerated through that program um, in six months, which is half the time it normally takes. Um, had uh, I was assistant manager of a store there, and um, I learned a lot about management, and I learned a lot about um, business more so. I mean, not that my degree didn't cover a lot of things, but uh, a lot, lots of hands-on activities, I, I would say, um, with enterprise. And um, last summer, my parents called me and said, hey, would you, would you move back and just help us take over, which is just come back and help. And I have a family, so um, I had to talk to my, at that time, fiance, and we had to think about taking our kids back out of school and moving back up here. So we moved here in December. Um, my first official day was December 23rd. It was a great time to move. <laughs> um, but in that short time, um, I have learned even more about myself and about this industry. Uh, the seven months that we've we've been here, it's been a really great time for me and a really great time for my family as well. Yeah. And for the brewery. And for the brewery. The new yes. build out for the canteen. You know, she's been instrumental in getting working on that. She and her husband has been helping with the construction, and so it's it's really truly is a family effort. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit more about that, about expansion from sure. the start to now. I mean, not even just the recent stuff. Um, I don't know which one of you would want to kind of talk about that, but can you talk about how you've grown over the seven years? We started out with just a very small system. Um, Ten gallons. <laughs> very, very small. Yes. And uh, three small fermenters. Mm -hmm. And then she can talk about probably the expansion of the number of gallons we can brew today. But we've had three different changes, overs, and systems yeah. over the years. We um, we started with a ten gallon system, and now we're at a seven barrel system. So um, in seven years, we've we've grown quite a lot. Um, as far as co like capacity, um, we can brew around five thousand gallons a month. Um, and out of that 5,000 gallons, I probably sell 5,000 gallons. So <laughs> yeah. it's really great. At um, We have two 15-barrel fermenters and then six 7-barrel um, fermenters. So at all times, those are usually full. We turn those over twice a month. Wow. That's so pretty great. Um, let's talk about the beer for a okay. second. Yeah, let's do so, it. So uh, do you guys have a beer that you consider your flagship beer? Or do you just have a number that you that are kind of your consistent? Well, I, I w I'd like to speak to the history of the flagships first. So let's mention the Gateway Club. Uh, for that 10 months that we were trying to get licensed, we decided to use it wisely because Clark was so obsessed with brewing that he was brewing two and three times a week, home brewing. I had uh, carboys sitting all over my house, in my closet, in my garage, in my laundry room. When he blew up a carboy of a blackberry stout all over my laundry room at 2 a.m., I said, get it out. <laughs> out. So we decided to take all of the beer that we'd been practicing with, take it up to a place where we belonged um, to a, a, a club, and so we have public tastings. And Clark would you know, brew the beer. I would look up the education about that particular beer style. So we decided to do education along with tasting. We did tasting cards so people could write down notes and could grade the beer for us. And that's how we came up with our five flagships, which were the most uh, popular ones, the, the favorites that everybody went back to each time. So from the five flagships we still have two that really shine through all the time but I think one of them has now taken the lead. Salamander Slam IPA is our most popular seller. Um, it's an English style IPA so it's going to be more malty whereas like a West Coast IPA is going to be heavy heavy hoppy. Um, we That beer probably outsells my other beers I don't know probably 30 percent. Um, it's uh, it's quite popular, but we also have another local favorite, um, our cream ale, Lily's Cream Boy Ale. Um, 
we joke and call it the gateway drug. <clears throat> so if you're not like totally into craft beer, or you're trying to get into craft beer, that's the gateway drug to start you off, you know what I mean? Um, so that's probably my, my second top seller. And those were both original flagship, what we consider flagship beers. Yeah. So It's a good local boy brew, you know, <laughs> or for women who are just learning how to drink beer, although a lot of women like the darker beers much, much mm-hmm. better a than lot of, A lot of women that like to drink red wines, mm-hmm. um, if they come in here, they're like, I'm not a wine, or I'm not a beer drinker, I'm a wine drinker. They would like heavy reds, like a Malbec. Um, I always like to get them to taste a stout or a porter because it has a similar mouthfeel to a heavy red wine, and that's usually what they'll gravitate toward. Even though the color can be intimidating, if you're not a beer drinker, um, it still is a nice compliment to a heavy red. Yeah, at the Gateway Club, um, the women who came in with their husbands who were tasting the beer, and the women said, I'm not into beer. No, I'm a wine drinker. I would take a stout or a porter pour it into a wine glass and say now try it Mm -hmm. and they would try it and by and large they would say you know that's not bad right (laughs) so (laughs) scarier it looks scarier than it is yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so as as the business has grown as the business has continued to develop are there certain resources that you guys have kind of leaned on in addition to I guess your educational background um, local resources or even statewide resources that have really helped you in this mm-hmm. growth? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest resources that we use is the NC Brewers Alliance. Um, so I'm sure you've, you're well versed after <laughs> 10 interviews. Um, but that's a great resource for all breweries, especially in North Carolina. Um, on their Facebook page, like there's a, a group that you can be a part of and they'll post um, certain things like once a week brewery trends or hey this this brewery is doing this so it's a really great place to come um, and grab research but also you you have all of the other breweries that are in the alliance at your disposal as well and it's a it's, it's about camaraderie really so um, you like to say that we are in competition with other breweries and that's kind of true but most of the time brewers just want to help out each other so it's a it's a great resource to be able to reach out and say hey you guys just did this beer last week or you just released it last week i I have questions like i want i want to try to do that style um so that's a really great resource but also um the small business center Um, here in Haywood County as well as in Jackson County. They've both have been really big helps Mm -hmm. in um, us trying to get to the next step along the way. Yeah, yeah, so I will put that out there. Thanks to the North Carolina Mm -hmm. uh, University Systems, the the colleges have the Small Business Center. It's a great resource. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, To back up to something that you said a minute ago, you know, we were talking about kind of that the first few months and getting all the permits and everything in place but you also mentioned you guys were the first brewery Mm -hmm. here were there issues permitty issues that came with being the first yes um we actually we were recently talked about that how um sometimes with with the permits and zoning the people that would come in to inspect would be like i actually don't know like i'm gonna have to go read up on that and i'll get back to you and so here we are just twiddling thumbs waiting to hear back like can we serve beer today is it going to be next week like what's going to happen um so that was probably the biggest hurdle to jump was that no one in our area really knew because we were the first you know and being um in the bible belt you, you have to be a certain distance away from a church or a school there's a church on every corner literally <laughs> in Haywood County so uh, and we weren't sure if the mission next door was going to be considered part of a church and so um, that that took some time to sort out as well yeah. but we were very blessed when we found this location it just happened to become empty and that's one of the biggest selling points here is that we're on the creek and have this just a great outdoor venue you yeah. know can you talk a little bit more about this location, just kind of where you are in relation to town and yeah. everything? So Frog Level is the historic district of Waynesville. Um, we're approximately two blocks from the main street. Um, and y'all basically drove by one day and saw that this, this space was for rent, right? Mm-hmm. And came to look at it and fell in love. And that's that's why we are Frog Level Brewing Company, because this space was open and we're in Frog Level. So yeah. Frog Level District, because of the uh, river out back, would when it would rain very hard, it would flood 
and the frogs, you know, were co- so this the was land this became level with the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> also, the fact that we lived less than a mile, so we could just zip back and forth from the brewery. The fact that we had both been in the military and had plenty of camouflage attire available and we thought okay well frogs are camouflaged and so are we and we won't have to spend a lot of money on uniforms we'll just wear camouflage <laughs> so all that came together plus the fact that our motto is be a level head and so um you know, bringing that into frog level and being responsible with your adult beverages is yeah. all ties in together. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, other, other than the wardrobe choices, I guess, do you feel like there are certain benefits from that military background that you and your husband both have that kind of went into opening and operating mm-hmm. this business? Well, definitely the discipline, you know, comes into play and just um, being able to be logistically um, organized for number one, uh, was a spillover, I think, from our military careers. But then also, people are so supportive of veterans these days. And so we're very proud that that's a part of our um, business, and it's on all of our cans and bottles on the labels, is that we're veteran-owned and operated. And, um, uh, you know, it's a great network out there of people who are very supportive of um military members and veterans and so we're grateful we have you know people who send um mail who email who get on facebook who instagram who are in the military or are veterans from all over the country Mm -hmm. who contact us because of that experience and we send them swag and they love the fact that some of our swag is very military oriented as well so yeah. Also, from an outsider's perspective, you guys are so used to serving that y'all still give back to the community in a different, it's a different matter of service, but um, they're both very big advocates for a local um, no-kill shelter, so we hold a lot of functions for them. We do functions for um, Haywood Waterways, so they're, they're still continuing to serve their local community, even though they're retired from the military excuse me, military, and that's kind of a beautiful thing to watch, because it's not, I don't think it's something that you or Clark ever really think about, yeah. but your your contribution is still there and present in our community. And I was a hospice nurse for many years also, so that, just good, I love the people of this area, people in Haywood County, and everybody just, just a good heart and a good feel here mm-hmm. in the county. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you just talked about is that some of your cans and materials kind of carry a military theme with them. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how long have y'all been canning or you mentioned cleaning bottles, so you may have been doing this all (laughs) along. Um, So we first started um, distribution in 2012. At that time, we only distributed growlers and what we call croakers, which are a mini growler, 32 ounce and 64 ounce. So we would fill directly from the taps, cases and cases and cases. We had a little old distributor um, that's called Millennium Beverage. They're not so little anymore. Um, But they would come and pick up around, I don't know, between 8 and 15 cases of growlers or croakers a week. Um, And then Later that year, maybe early 2013, we started canning and we used um, Land of Sky mobile canning and they would come in and they would set up um, and they would can straight from a fermenter. Um, But then it got to the point where they were so busy that we had to be put on a waiting list. So sometimes we would have beer sitting too long, we wouldn't be able to can it, we'd have to keg it and just get it out in the tasting room. So we decided last year, um, last summer actually, we bought our own canner. So now we do all of our canning in house and we can whenever we want to, we can whatever we want to. Um, So that's been really great. So we have six cans um, that we keep permanently and then we 
we rotate seasonal beers. We usually have between four and six seasonals on at a time. So what's um, Matt, our brewer, kegs a seasonal, he'll, he'll can just a few cases of those seasonals and we'll be able to push those as like a mixed pack with some of our other beers as well. So that's been really exciting um, for me to get to witness and sort of be a part of because it was a really big step for us to take. Um, but it's been really rewarding thus far. So that's, yeah. that's been really great. I remember when we were still brewing on the little Sabco system and and because of Millennium being distributing across North Carolina, we would go, you know, down to Wilmington and see our one of our croakers in in a place in Wilmington or in Greensboro. And I would get so excited. <laughs> Our beer is here. I took pictures, you know. But even today, if I see our beer yeah. somewhere else, you know, World of Beer or, or someplace, I, I take a picture of it because I like to see it amongst all of the other representatives there. Yeah. Yeah. So Millennium still does distribute in uh, most of North Carolina and all of South Carolina for us. We also use Budweiser of Asheville. Um, so they kind of hit the Haywood County, Buncombe County markets for us. So we're in um, pretty much all the Walmarts in this area, Food Lion, Ingalls, um, some convenience stores like gas stations and stuff like that. So we've gone um, a, a really far away from being in really small bottle shops to the common grocery store. And I think our canning line has really helped out with that because yeah. we're able to push out a lot more product mm -hmm. and keep up with supply and demand. Yeah. But I'm sure you guys still do. I mean, this is a great space. So I'm sure you guys still are pretty busy in the tap room. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you find the balance between how much to can versus what to have here? You know what? It's sort of like, it's sort of like gambling, to, to be completely honest. Um, there, there is a science to it, but um, most of the time I can look at our reports and see what's selling in the tasting room. and. I'll say to myself, like, I, I would rather sell that in the tasting room than give that to my distributor because I know I, I make a majority of my money off of my regulars and my locals, and I'm going to continue to supply what they what they demand, what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's, it's a crapshoot, you know? Sometimes you don't get it right, and it's all about learning. I think that that's probably one of the most beautiful things about the brewing industry is that every day you learn something new. So sometimes you learn about beer, and sometimes you learn about selling beer. <laughs> and hopefully you find a balance. And hopefully you find a balance, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So this, this may be a weird, difficult question, but can you talk about what like a typical, what's a typical week like around sure. here? I know burst, burst brewing cycles aren't just a day, so a day is hard. But right. Um, typical day. So we brew Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, usually, and um, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. It's kind of a loaded question. So typically we brew Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then um, as far as the brewing site's concerned, Thursday, Friday, it's sort of like a, either a kegging day or cleaning keg day or cleanup in general day um, before the tap room opens. Um, as far as like length of brewing, like sometimes if we're just filling a seven barrel fermenter, Matt, our brewer, only has to brew once. But the, the beers that we can, he'll do a double batch. So we'll brew twice in one day to fill up the 15 barrel fermenter. And then we'll get around 30 kegs out of that and about 75 cases. Um, so it depends sort of on what, what the projected canning schedule is going to be like and what, um, what our projected sellers are going to be. So you can sort of look at the market trend. Thankfully, we have technology now that helps us see those things. Um, so you can sort of, I can look at a, a report and say, well, over the last you know three months, we've sold an abundance of this, this, and this. We should probably go ahead and rebrew that beer right now because I project we'll run out in, th in three weeks sort of thing. So the brewing schedule kind of depends on um, how, how our local market is trending. Um, our distribution market is pretty constant. So both of my distributors order around the same amount of the same beers. So that's sort of easy to predict there, if, that, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. And then in the tasting room, um, in the afternoons, we have a lot of tourists here. Yeah. So we get a lot of tourism in the afternoon. 
um, a lot of retirees who come in in the afternoon just to sit out in the shade by the creek before the you know everything gets busy. Uh, a lot of destination tourists who come because of the beer scene in and around Asheville. Um, so we have uh, bruise crews that come occasionally, um, but then spillovers. So people are, it's sort of like the um, Napa Valley of the beer industry around here. You know, people, it's a destination. People come to do just the beer tour. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in the evening we have um, live music a couple of times a week. Um, and we have an outdoor stage. So Saturday night, for instance, was just a perfect night to have Darren Nicholson band, some of the members of Balsam Range here. Um, playing outside and everybody's just having a great time out on the deck and uh, of course in the winter time we have the bands inside here and it's packed and you can't hardly weave through the crowd to get people <laughs> their beer you know uh, but soon then we'll have food we usually will have a beer truck that comes I mean a food truck that will come um, but pretty soon we won't have to do that will we that's right we'll have the canteen open and yeah. great Pub food, better than great pub food. Um, pub fair with a modern flair. There you go. Can you talk a little bit about the decision to go that route? Sure. So food, um, food has kind of always been the ugly stepchild, right? So it's something that you have to love, but you don't necessarily want to. Um, and when we first opened, and actually still to, to, to today we are food friendly, so you want to have pizza delivered, have pizza delivered. You want to go next door to the coffee shop and get a sandwich, get a sandwich. You want to go down the street to Burger King, whatever you want, just bring it in. <clears throat> it was something that we didn't necessarily um, have the resources to deal with. But as we have expanded um, and as our beers have become more popular, we have some more resources that we're able to grab onto. Um, part of our problem was space. So we have a very large brewery, but we also have a lot of stuff like uh, fermenters <laughs> and a brew house and tables and a bar <laughs> and kegs. <laughs> so um, with the expansions that we've done, um, the first time we actually expanded from the 10 gallon system into the next step up, which I think was three, three barrels, we had to redesign the whole brewery. So our bar was over here, not over there. We had to rearrange everything. So part of the challenge was finding where, where would we put a kitchen if we were gonna have one. Um, we've tossed around the idea of doing a food truck for a minute, but there's a lot of really awkward ordinances about food trucks. Um, but then the space next door to us became available and we were able to sort of grab onto that, cut a giant hole in the wall, called it a day. Um, and our projected opening dates this weekend, so oh, July wow. 4th weekend. Yeah, we're really excited. Um, my husband actually is um, taking on that responsibility. Um, but it just, it was about timing and it was about um, space, I guess. Those are the two biggest challenges for us. And um, it's definitely a necessity. Um, and I think it's going to take us to the next level. I think it's going to get us where we want to be in, in the next five or ten years. Mm -hmm as far as uh, sales go. Yeah. Well, we've always been very family oriented and so, um, and dogs, you know, we have plenty of dogs through here every day, kids, because um, we have the little games, you know, cornhole and air hockey and things for the kids to play. So I, I guess that was one of the biggest surprises for me was um, that people were willing to bring their kids to a brewery. And uh, so when we first opened, here they would come with their grocery bags. They bought a loaf of bread and some lunch meat stuff, <laughs> you know, and chips. And they'd spread it out and feed their kids. And they get to hang out and have a beer. The kids could play in the creek, play games. They don't have to pay a babysitter. And the family gets to experience something together rather than you know, just having parents night out and kids staying behind at home. So now they won't have to bring their grocery bags <laughs> <laughs> or order pizza from yeah. somewhere and have it delivered. Yeah, well and you know, with a family owned business that's family friendly, it just, I think you guys have a very 
interesting, unique, wonderful kind of setup with all of yeah, that. Can absolutely. you talk a little bit about kind of the benefits of having having a brewery that operates as a family business? Mm -hmm. Well, I can say that that was one of the challenges to begin with, actually, was that my, my dad is a Southern Baptist minister. And so I my never, grandfather was too. <laughs> okay, well, see. And so, and our son, our oldest son is a Southern Baptist minister. But um, so, you know, I didn't want to be disrespectful to my parents. Um, so that was kind of tough at first when Clark said, I really want to do this, I really want to brew beer. And we talked to my parents about it. And um, my mom actually has been one of our biggest supporters. So once we got over that hurdle, then we knew that this was going to be a family affair. That our, you know, our kids, our middle son is now works with the sheriff's department, but he used to also work here when he was in college. So it was just kind of easy for us because we didn't have to leave our kids to go to work. Our kids were here too. And so it brought us all closer together, closer knit. I think Celeste and Dylan got really close and it was good to see that um, between brother and sister running the bar together. Um, <laughs> Fun times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably most of the time. Fun most, times. yeah. Well, you know, with every family, there's going to be that one day where you're, you contemplate going to jail. Is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and now that he works in the jail, you know, you don't... <clears throat> <laughs> but, but it made me feel less guilty that we needed to spend so many hours, yeah. you know, working on the business because we had them with us. Yeah, because I would think, especially at the beginning, the hours have to be pretty... Mm -hmm. it, it still is very labor-intensive. Um, they, they're, My mom and dad want to phase themselves out. They're ready for full retirement, and they duly deserve it. Um, so I, I kind of get to experience now... Uh, the the labor part <clears throat> both manual and mental <clears throat> um, I can lift kegs like no one's business though I'm stronger than I look for sure um, but as far as the family oriented uh, environment it it really was kind of a natural fit so like she said we are a family and we were always here so welcoming other families to join our family was the, the next step and I think that that's one of the niches that we have here is that it's we're kind of like cheers you know you walk in and everybody knows your name and we love we love this area we love the community and it's really like getting to see an extended part of my family when I come to work mm -hmm. and get to see other families that's true so. and now her son is working here too helping his dad in the yeah. kitchen area a giant family affair well, I love yeah. it I love it <laughs> And, the, and some of the games and stuff came later, you know, as the, the market tells you what they want. Um, but now we're, we're, we're pretty set up for a fun night out, um, a fun family night out. Mm -hmm. And I think um, honing in on our motto, which is to be a level head, our bartenders like to promote that as well. So we don't have like a beer cap per se, but they're very well trained in, in experiencing whether a person is exhibiting signs of severe intoxication. Um, so that it's not awkward when a family with three kids walks in mm -hmm. and there's some person stumbling around. You know, that doesn't really happen here. And that's sort of a wonderful thing too, is that um, you can come here without worrying that your kids are gonna be exposed to that environment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so off the top of your head, yeah. including family. How many folks do you guys have working here? We have five employees, um, including myself. <clears throat> so we're very small. Um, I actually didn't include Clark, so yeah. six technically. <laughs> we, we've never taken a paycheck. Let's just, <laughs> it all goes back into the business. Right. Um, as we get the kitchen open, that's going to be changing, of course, because we'll have to have a bigger staff to support um, the extra extension there. But um, we've had around, we've had five employees for going on three years now, yeah. so it's kind of time for that next big step um, and to hire some more people yeah. on, which I'm excited about too. Yeah, and kind of to follow up on that, 
you know, you kind of hinted on this with, with the kitchen, but where do, you, where do you want to see the business go in the next five, six, seven years? Um, I definitely want to focus on distribution. So we have North Carolina and South Carolina kind of honed in. I'd like to see um, us get into Georgia and, uh, and East Tennessee in the next five years and have, you know, I really just want to take over the East Coast for being completely honest. Um, that would be that would really be my goal. A lot more than five employees. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. I said we were adding on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, the purpose of some of the interviews that I'm doing is to talk to women yeah. in the industry, and this is an industry that is stereotypically mm-hmm. men yeah. in the industry. And um, you know, can you talk a little bit about being a woman in an industry that? I think has women in it, people just don't necessarily notice or think about that. Can you talk a little bit about maybe challenges or even benefits that come with a woman's being a woman or having a woman's perspective in this industry? Benefit, organization. <laughs> we we're much more organized, or I'm. We are much more organized, I should say, than our male, our male counterparts. <laughs> Um, I can't speak for all males. I'm just saying the men involved at frog level. So we add a, an extra bonus there. That's uh, the biggest benefit. Um, the challenge is, mm, in general, um, women have been more prone to be introduced into the workforce. So it's not uncommon to see a woman at work. It is uncommon to see a woman at work here. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes um, we don't get as much respect as maybe the men do because we couldn't possibly know what we're talking about when it comes to beer. That's a men's, that's for the men, you know, stick to your wine. Um, So that's challenging sometimes. In my first couple weeks coming back here, even though I had been a bartender here for five years, um, coming back and taking over it, it took a long time for me to, to gain respect, not only of some of my customers, but um, my staff members as well. And that's sort of natural. A new boss is coming in. Things are going to be changing, yada, yada. Um, but it's, it's, it's weird because people would come to me and ask a beer question and then would look at a man and say, actually, never mind. I'm going to ask him. But I'm, I'm very well qualified for this position, not only because of my degree, but because of my knowledge in, in, in beer. Um, so that's probably the biggest hurdle is just trying to communicate or express that just because I'm a woman, it doesn't mean I, I'm not knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. And being an older woman, too. I wouldn't know about if that. If you see... <laughs> <laughs> Most women who are working in beer these days are younger. Mm-hmm. And so I remember when we first got started and people would look at me like, what is she doing here? <laughs> you know, and I love chivalry. I want, I love it when a man will open a door for me and so forth. But um, one delivery I made when we first opened and I came carrying two kegs in and the guys are like, no, no, I'll, let me get those. Just, just leave them there. Just let me, and I'm like, I got this, you know, so don't assume that I'm physically weak just because I'm female. Let me do my job. But thank you all the same. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we, Celeste and I did um, a festival together down in Charlotte the first year we were open or the second year we were open. So here she was, a young female, and I'm, you know, older female and they came up to our they would come up to our booth and and then kind of look around for where the men were (laughs) (laughs) so um but yeah i'm proud of the fact that oh absolutely we're both strong women i'm strong independent woman (laughs) but sometimes i need a man (laughs) every once in a while yeah so if we had a woman wander through right now who said, I want to go into this industry. What would you say to her? What, what advice would you give her? So one of my biggest <clears throat> pieces of advice would be to find a mentor. Um, I, my mentor's name is Nicole, and she used to be in charge of distribution for Bujen. Um, she's moved on to bigger, wonderful, beautiful things. Um, 
but having a mentor someone who <clears throat> is doing or has done what you're striving to do someone that is confident in their position and that can give you solid advice um, would be my number one piece of advice for that person secondly um, not only can you gain advice from a mentor but I learned a long time ago that if you vent up instead of down or to someone equal you're more apt to find a better solution so if your mentor is someone who is, is in a higher position in this industry or even if it's someone that has more tenure than you do in this industry having that person that you can say listen I just am so angry because this permit guy said this or this distributor said this um, their advice to you is going to be more solid than someone who's on the same level that you are mm -hmm. so those those two things would be what I would say mm -hmm. and what I would say is you know I mean, we've just been joking about the male female thing <laughs> but you know don't have a chip on your shoulder yeah. allow a man to mentor you if that man seems knowledgeable and is willing to work with you so I would say travel around and visit as many breweries as you can mm -hmm. make it a point to call ahead and see if the owner is going to be there and you can talk to the owner or the manager and ask them what works and what doesn't work um, and then glean all of that knowledge the best and the worst so that you're set up for success yeah. to start mm -hmm. with yeah solid so what would you say is your favorite part of working in the North Carolina beer industry? I think for me it goes back to camaraderie. We have a lot of awesome breweries in North Carolina. I don't like to brag, but we're the best, you know what I mean? North Carolina in general. So that's my favorite part, um, is getting to experience beers with other people. Um, like tomorrow, actually, we're doing a collaboration with a local tap room. Um, that, that sort of thing makes it fun. Um, if we're, you know, we ran out of can boxes, I can call Boojum and say, hey guys, help me out. And they do the same thing, you know? So I really enjoy the fact that all of the breweries in North Carolina are pretty much a giant family and we all want the same things. Um, plus the product that we make, you get to test it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my second favorite part. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. You get to meet people from all walks of life mm -hmm. that have come in and just, um, whether it's for a celebration, um, it's an event, we do weddings here, receptions here. We once even had a baby shower here where the woman waited, wanted to have her baby shower after the baby was born so she could enjoy the beer as well as everyone else. Um, Styles and quarters increased lactation by like 15%, by the way. It so. used to be that English physicians would um, prescribe the dark beers for women because mm -hmm. it was supposed to help them lactate. Yeah, yeah. It's a thing. But anyway, so, and there's been times, honestly, when in an early part of the day when someone who's a little down on their luck comes in and um, my husband has actually had the opportunity to pray with people here who were seeking, who were, you know, in anguish and needed help. So, um, all the way from that to those life celebrations, seeing people in all walks of life in every situation of life is unique to me, besides the fact that we get to experiment with really cool things to put into an alcoholic beverage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you guys have been open for a while now. Can you talk a little bit about just in general in North Carolina how the beer scene how do you how has it changed since you've been open because it's changed a lot mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot more of it mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so as far as craft breweries like I don't know five years ago I think we had a 12% market share and now we're up to like 25% not just in North Carolina but, um, that's kind of a global matter there um, but nonetheless still a, a pretty drastic increase in the craft beer scene um, as far as North Carolina, we've exploded with a number of breweries, and we're one of the, or this area rather, is like 
the top 10 destination cities in the world for beer. Um, so I guess the biggest change we've seen is the, the increase of, of the amount of breweries and the amount of beer. Um, there's a, the Carolina Championship of Beer. It's a, a competition that's hosted once a year. Um, last year, I think there were like 60-something winners, but this year there were like 90-something winners. So not only are there more beers, but we're, we're making better beers, um, which is a beautiful thing to witness, not just for Frog Level, but um, for our neighboring communities and their breweries as well. Yeah, we got 17 medals this year in one competition. So. Yeah, 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 we did. That's not bad. No, nope. not bad. <laughs> we're, we're pretty proud. <laughs> yeah. So you talked about kind of uh, better beer in North Carolina. I'm going to be honest. This is the hardest question for most people. Okay. What's your favorite beer from a brewery other than your own? Well, I know that right away. Me too. Yeah. You go first. The um, <clears throat> the watermelon wheat from Husk Hardware. That sounds. I would drink that right now. It's really. <laughs> really good <laughs> um i really enjoy catawba i love pretty much anything that catawba puts out but one of my favorite beers is their white zombie um which is a wit um sort of lower in alcohol things like five percent but just delicious yeah perfect it's a perfect drinking beer for any occasion yeah whether you're hot or you're cold i don't know i'm all about the white zombie <laughs> yeah and what about your favorite beer can you pick a favorite well, That's Catcher in the Rye is my favorite <clears throat> because it's my recipe. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that yeah. one and how you developed Humble the recipe? Humble and modest, <laughs> I was going to say, you open up that. you got to talk about how that recipe came to be. Well, I love hoppy beers. And so when we were still home brewing, there was a beer, Red's Rye PA, that I loved to, to have. And um, so I said... You know, I want to see if I can brew this. I wonder what makes it the way it is. And so I said that year for my birthday, that's what I was going to do. I was going to take the day off from my work at hospice and brew, try to brew a, a rye pale ale. So I did. I went and got the ingredients, and that's how I spent my birthday. And um, I like the fact that it has that little wild flavor to it from the rye. Um, and has just the right amount of hops for me and it is 30 percent rye so that's a pretty hefty amount of rye um, for for any beer <clears throat> so you do have that nice earthy um, almost bitterness from the rye the hops really uh, sort of balance that out with the citrus um, it's a very well balanced beer mm -hmm. and still has a malty backbone still but very malty yeah almost like a wheat backbone mm -hmm. um, only with that little wild edge yeah. and a pretty color. It is beautiful. It's a beautiful <laughs> amber. Um, my favorite beer right now, we have a Blood Orange Goza that we uh, recently just licensed. It's very new to us. Southern Sally is her name. Um, so the Southern Salamander <clears throat> is uh, the color of a blood orange with a you know very bright orange, uh, almost reddish stripe down its back. So that's how she got her name. Um, and it is does have a weak backbone um but our brewer matt has done a fabulous job with infusing blood oranges into this beer so um it is in the sour family it's a little salty um very tart um but if you've ever had salt and citrus together you know it's a very well married couple and that's my favorite drinking beer it's perfect for summer because it's very refreshing um and it's a, the newest member to our licensed family, so I'm really happy to have it on board. Yeah. So I'm sure, uh, I don't know how much free time you get to have, <laughs> but in your time when you're not here, what, what do you enjoy doing? How do you enjoy spending your time? I really like to make fun of my teenagers. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that anyone with teenagers makes yeah. fun of slash embarrassing yeah, them. Yeah, that's kind of the best part. But just goofing off with them, um, I really do love my family, and I love um, when we get to spend time together and we don't um, have to worry about about work. Because because my husband and I both work here, it's sort of it's not only the common denominator, but it, it is um, 
it over dominates our, our conversations mm-hmm. so if we can just not talk about work and just goof off it's the best time that's my favorite thing and we all play instruments so it's really nice to just sit in the living room and everybody picks something up and we just jam together and have a good time so that's probably my favorite way to spend my time now as a as a mom yeah and i quilt um, she is old <laughs> I'm, just, I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no quilts for you. I quilt. Yes. You don't get any more quilts. <laughs> you know, passed down from generations. My grandmother had a, a, a quilting frame in her living room that she would drop down, you know, and just quilt at night. My mother quilts. My parents are getting older, so I go and help them one day a week. Um, my dad is a, um, he has a large orchard of heirloom apples and peaches and pears and plums and apricots and hazelnuts just about everything you can think of every berry and so uh, that requires a lot of work pruning and keeping the trees and going getting everything ready for the farmers market so I go and help my parents one day a week and um, I work some for my church and spend time with my good friends and family <laughs> she this is the most adorable thing i have to i have to say it she they, she hosts a sit and sip every week it is the most precious thing to me i don't know why <clears throat> but they have hors d'oeuvres and they just sip on wine and all the girlfriends meet up and they just chat and sip and sit it's talk about i cannot wait to retire so that i can also do that i want to host <laughs> sit and sip at my house yeah. oh, life goals you are at a bar though so yeah, you can host it here. I c- sit and sit at Tropical Brewing Company. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would come. Um, <laughs> so those are pretty much the questions that I came prepared with. Is there any piece of kind of the story of the brewery that we didn't get to touch on today that y'all want to make sure to talk about, or did we did we manage to cover all the bases? Um. I think I, w- I just want to give accolades to my husband Clark and for his um, perseverance and you know and his drive to see his dream come to fruition and I really have been on the fringes of that because I did work need to work full time so that <laughs> he could not take a paycheck from here but um, you know he started out being our brewer and um, and then we we hired someone who could help him and <clears throat> and then we hired someone who actually went to brewing science school and so I think the quality has really come a long way not that he was doing anything wrong but we, it's just a learning process but I think you know he comes to work almost every day and wants to see this business succeed for our next generation so I would just I would like to say that I really appreciate my husband he's a good man hashtag best dad ever and a smart business man. <laughs> yes <clears throat> yeah well thank you guys so much for sitting down and talking to me you. I really what appreciate it thank you